The night the sky split open, the Flak 88 stood like a dark cathedral, its steel mouth aimed at burning stars, while the crew beneath it moved with a practiced, terrified rhythm. They were men who had learned to measure danger not by distance, but by sound. The quick, high-pitched whisper of approaching bombers. The hollow thump when a shell struck nearby Earth. The sickening rattle when a round exploded too close to the gun carriage. Operating the Flak 88 was a choreography of violence and vulnerability. The gun could reach the heavens, yet the men who tended it were pinned to the ground by everything that gun revealed. When the order came, the crew unfurled into their stations. The loader gripped the brass casing, feeling the heat through leather gloves. The aimer peered through optics clouded with condensation and gun oil. The fuse setter adjusted a slender device that would decide whether the shell would bloom at altitude or send shrapnel into the dark. The Flak 88 was precise enough to require patience, but patience was luxuries the sky rarely afforded. The gun's recoil jolted the platform like an answering blow. Every shot demanded men to step out into breath-stealing noise, to expose themselves to return fire and to the machine's own appetite. The danger that haunted these crews came from three directions at once. Above, enemy bombers brought their payloads and escort fighters, and later in the war, ground attack aircraft learned to hunt the guns themselves. On the ground, artillery and counter-battery fire sought the telltale plume of white smoke that betrayed a firing position. Within the crew, the gun itself was an unforgiving hazard. Cases jammed, shells detonated prematurely, recoils sheared rivets, and flying brass turned the flanks into torn metal. Men spoke quietly about the moments when the gun seemed to turn traitor an overpressured charge that shattered a shell, a brittle fuse that sparked a cascade of shrapnel among those whose hands had just touched it. There were subtler threats that history rarely honors. The Flak 88's carriage transmitted force into the soil and the bodies of men, so that after hours of firing, the whole position trembled with a fatigue that went bone deep. Fingers numbed from repeated loading, vision blurred from smoke and the afterimages of tracers. The gun's optics, perfect for locking onto aircraft at distance, were ruined by the flare of a single incendiary. A man who could see a bomber at distance could be blinded by a ground flare. Ammunition supply became a psychological hazard. The steady clink of rounds being passed forward was reassurance. But when that rhythm faltered, a different panic took hold. That pause could mean resupply trucks caught in shelling, ammunition arriving late, or simple exhaustion in men who had been awake for hours patching wounds and filling belts. One hidden fact that surprised many later readers was how the Flak 88's very effectiveness made its crews targets of a new sort of predator. Fighter bombers learned a straightforward calculus. Knock out the gun, and you deny the enemy air defenses. They came in low, with rockets and bombs, aiming not at the bomber stream, but at the ground positions where the guns crouched. Crews adapted by digging in deeper, by masking the muzzle flash with discharges timed to produce confusing smoke, by launching dummy firings to draw fire away. Still, Nothing erased the terror of a strafing pass when bullets stitched the air around the crew and the man at the fuse setter clutched metal and prayed for a miss. Another secret lay in the gun's afterlife on the battlefield. Designed as an anti-aircraft weapon, the Flak 88 showed an uncanny versatility when a wave of enemy tanks approached. Crews who had been trained to tally altitude and fuse intervals found themselves dragging the mounting into hull-down positions, adjusting for range instead of height, and watching their shells punch through armor with a satisfying, sick sound. That adaptability was a blessing and a curse. 
The gun that could stop tanks quickly became a top priority target for counterattacks, and crews who celebrated a knocked out enemy vehicle would soon find themselves under a different kind of assault. The middle of that night delivered an unexpected lesson. Smoke hung low, and the stars had all but gone out when a high explosive shell struck a near miss, spraying the emplacement with earth and a smell like old metal. For a heartbeat, the crew thought, irrationally, that they had been spared. Then the shell's fragments began to chew metal, and the younger loader, his face smeared with oil and the pale light of tracer, caught the full blast of shrapnel. There is an awakening in sudden injury, one second surrounded by elbows and routine, the next reduced to raw pain. It was in that moment the unit commander realized the awful arithmetic writers rarely chart. The Flak 88 demanded not only courage, but a supply chain, maintenance crews, medical care, and an ever-rotating roster of replacements. Without those, the gun was a proud ruin waiting for a single good shot. The climax arrived before dawn. A formation of fighter bombers dove in tight, and the gun spat a string of brass and fire, each round a gamble. The aimer tracked a low sweeping wing as if he could stitch the thin silhouettes of aircraft into a thread and cut it. One rocket struck a nearby support vehicle, turning fuel into a brief volcanic inferno that lit faces and revealed positions across the sector. Men moved as one organism, pulling the wounded behind the armor of the gun, shoving fresh rounds into the chamber. The whole emplacement ringing with commands and curses and the metallic cough of the gun. They stopped three planes that day. They lost two good men. They watched the field where they had dug themselves become a graveyard of scorched earth and spent brass. When the sun finally lifted, it revealed the true ledger of the night. The Flak 88 had spoken and had saved aircraft, cities, and sometimes the lives of those in the sky. It had also exacted its toll in lives at its muzzle, in burned hands and ears forever ringing, in young faces that had grown too old in a single long vigil. The takeaway that clings is not a tidy sentiment, but a recognition. The Flak 88 was both a bulwark and a beacon. Its power drew enemies and breathed survival. Its needs, ammunition, crews, shelter, maintenance, were the war's quiet demands. Decades later, when farmers pull brass from hedgerows or an old photograph finds its way to a kitchen table, they hold a fragment of that dangerous truth. The war was never won by steel alone, but by the exhausted, exposed hands that kept that steel firing under fire. If you enjoyed this, Tap like and subscribe. It really helps. And drop a quick comment telling us where you're watching from. The United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, or anywhere else in the world. Your reply helps the video reach more people just like you.